Thank you very much. So is peace just warfare elsewhere? I'm sorry, this is a rather sobering talk. <laughs> I grew up in a war. Every day I dressed Belinda in her navy blue panic suit. You probably don't know what a panic suit is, but I do. She packed her panic bag. I packed it with her. Checked to make sure that the red lozenge button sewn on her left shoulder to attract attention was turned on. With Belinda, I climbed into a lifeboat. Belinda was my doll. We were doing lifeboat drill. I was three years old. It was just over 70 years ago, in the middle of World War II. We were traveling across the world for nine weeks in a convoy of ships which submarines attacked. We were not allowed to know the route we were going. All we wanted to do was to make sure we lived or died with friends and family in war-torn England. From New Zealand, we landed at Liverpool. Somehow the feeling of the voyage has never left me. The feeling is neither good nor bad, it's just life. Then one day, this feeling became a deliberate thought. Human beings do not live in ready-made societies which then go to war. It is the other way round. We must turn our ideas completely on their head. Warfare is one of the main ways through which we make our societies. It is how we create our civilizations. War comes first. Society comes second. Does this seem pessimistic? Perhaps it does. But in these dark times, it may be that the only way we can begin to think about where to go next is to realize that we create our societies through war. To me, warfare, or war, is therefore killing which is allowed. It is killing we think we must do. We are shocked by illegal killing. Illegal killing is murder. But when does this distinction between legal killing and murder start? I suggest it starts with a very particular prohibition on carrying out a very particular murder. It is a prohibition that will only work if, um, and only, if we can leave, sorry, it, is a, it will only work if the violence can be allowed to go somewhere else than in murder. That somewhere else is war. To stop war, we think we have to tell society to stop being violent. For example, no nation should have nuclear weapons. We march against the bomb. But the protest is not what I mean by a prohibition. We can't prohibit the bomb. And this is where our assumption of turning things on its head immediately comes into effect. We can't stop war because by definition, war is violence which has been allowed. What I suggest is that in order for war to be allowed amongst adults, some so other sort of violence has already been prohibited, prohibited in childhood. You may think that I'm, as, as I am a psychoanalyst, I'm going to talk about the Oedipus complex. Well, I'm not. This is not about marrying your mother and killing your father as Oedipus did. It is not about children and their parents. Because although there are military commanders, father figures in war, war is mostly carried out by adult men who are on a level with each other. Psychoanalysis, like other social and psychological sciences, has, I think, not thought through sufficiently seriously about what it means when children fight together, interacting not with adults, but with each other. So I'm looking for a special sort of prohibition that operates between children, more than just saying, don't do that, stop it. Something like a human law to which we all subscribe so absolutely automatically that we don't even know we want to commit murder. I'm looking for something that is universal, a psychological rule that prohibits us doing one sort of killing that rightly we call murder, and by preventing this murder necessitates another sort of killing, killing that we call war. This prohibition is psychological because it becomes part of our makeup, of how we think. It is not a rule we have to be told every day. It is a rule that we have once internalized, makes up the social and individual beings that we are. It means it ha this has to happen when we stop from being pre-social babies and become instead social children and then social adults. Obeying this law makes us social, makes us make society. Psychoanalysts work only with unconscious processes. It is these which describe how a prohibition, a law, gets internalized, how it comes to be part of who we are. The ancient Greek authors of Oedipus' story make it clear that Oedipus did not know that Jocasta, whom he married, was his mother, nor that Laius, whom he killed, was his father. But that is just how a play presents what I would call unconscious, 
we don't know our basic wishes. The prohibition on sibling murder, which is what I think is at stake here, is not as deeply unconscious as Oedipus's desire for incest. Because instead of being buried, the desire to murder has been split off, put somewhere else in our psyche where its energy can be still used. It is used for legal killing, for warfare. This split isn't entirely successful, so abuses always accompany warfare. The prohibition on murdering your brother, can it be a general, a universal rule? I think so. All a universal prohibition means is that as humans, we have something at root in common with each other. Even if we speak different languages, all of us speak, might tell our loves and hates, go to war. Something in common is beyond the fact that we have a similar biology and is beyond the fact that we have cultural differences. There is what in psychoanalysis we call the law of the father against having sex with your mother. So I suggest there is also a law of the mother which operates her, between her children to prevent you killing your sibling. Because war is so obviously mostly a male activity, it is more particularly a prohibition on murdering your brother which allows you to kill your enemy instead. How does this come about? We know that young men are the most violent group in any society, that's a fact. What we don't take notice of is that there is one other group that is also unbelievably violent. These are very small children between the ages of two and three. Children beginning to walk and beginning to talk. Lovely children, as Bruce described. Toddlers, in other words. We never entirely lose the child we have been. So imagine for a moment that you are a toddler. There is a sense of being small, of fears and pleasures, of attachments such as I had to Belinda. These are called memories in feelings. Like my feeling from my three-year-old self, that I can remember how it felt that there was always a war. Being a toddler comes out of having been a baby. We carry that sense with us. But suppose somebody else comes along, a smaller, needier person, taking up the space you understood was yours, and yours alone. Suddenly, you are not the baby anymore. Your mother loves another baby, another you. This is the worst thing that can happen. It is who you are, are who you are. At this age, two, two to three, more than being Jane or Johnny, you are the baby of the family. Your world has shattered. Who you are has been stolen from you. Look at what Freud said. You have been dethroned, dethroned despoiled, prejudiced, in your, in your rights. I'll have a drink of water while you read that. <laughs> One psychologist writing today has pointed out that the only reason that toddlers don't kill each other is because we don't give them knives or guns with which to do so. <laughs> the toddler's tantrums are because this new baby has taken away its livelihood. So for the toddler, it becomes be killed by this intruder or kill it. It feels like a matter of survival. So it's not only uh, cavemen that are our ancestors, as Anthony was pointing out, it's our toddlers that are our ancestors here and now. And in their fight for their own survival, getting rid of the other one who's taken their place, murdering that other one, because they have to learn it's not come just for Christmas, is what a survival means. There cannot be two people who are the same. We think we hate people who are different, and we do. But turning our things on their head shows that the problem starts because we fear someone is the same as us. They must be got rid of. I know this may sound like an exaggeration, but the perpetual presence of warfare and its abuses show that it is not. We think we go to war because the enemy is so different. We forget we have made them different because someone who seems to be the same as us feels like our own death. Killing the sibling is prohibited by the law of the mother who will not love us or look after us anymore if we follow through on that impulse. This law of the mother is a universal prohibition. If we are only or last children, then it is the baby we are always expecting to arrive, or the baby our friend has been landed with. This baby, or its substitute, any baby, cannot be murdered. Our mother won't let us. We have to go off, out of the family, and play with our friends and fight with our foes. We have to construct a society on this basis. So we split the world into good siblings whom we love as ourselves and bad not siblings on whom we can turn our murderous wishes into wars. This is why in so many wars, someone who was a brother one moment becomes an enemy the next. 
The toddler surfaces us in us throughout life when we are terrified that anyone might be the same as us and take our place. If someone takes our job at work, if an immigrant thinks they can be British, if a Jew thinks he can be a German, anywhere there is a religion or culture that fears being taken over by another. Well, there are many, many aspects of the question of war that change if we turn our ideas on our head and see that it is not that societies already exist and go to war, but war that creates society. For instance, when our new upside down way of looking at our understanding of war, it changes also our understanding of gender. War constructs the gender distinction, man, woman, in its own warrior image. And it is this war warrior, non-warrior distinction that the child takes into the society it'll form. Although millions of men are pacifists, being a man means that when push comes to shove, you will fight for your country. Just as forcefully to be a woman is on no account to be aggressive. Even with female conscription, as in Israel, 99.9% .9 of the world's combat troops are men. As war is constructed with gender in mind, gender is also constructed with war in mind. The mother's law against murdering our sibling therefore sets social life in motion. We must have brothers in arms and find a new enemy to kill. With these thoughts in hand, turning on its head the idea that we are in society and then go to war, means that we have to look at a different place to ask what is to be done. I, only suggest, I can only suggest a starting point. To understand murder is the opposite of murdering. We need to begin to think differently. This is primarily, I suppose, a thought talk rather than an acting talk, but it very much in my mind is that it thinks that can hopefully lead to different sorts of action if we can have different sorts of thinking. So we need to begin with thinking differently, taking one huge step back from where we thought the problem lay. For this, we need thinking space. We need to see how terribly, tragically, unfortunately, inevitable, as highly relevant to the war on terror, is this proximity of murder to legal warfare. To my surprise, I got this thinking space recently when I went to see Titus Andronicus at the Globe Theatre in London. Standing for three hours in the pit, strong men had fainted at the play. Its violence was so overwhelming, so in the audience's face, we felt ourselves as participators. But not only participators. The play was horrific. Disemboweling, chopped off heads and hands, rape and murder a minute. I'm squeamish, but I was hooked. Shakespeare, however, had made us think about how revenge begets revenge begets revenge. Any form of creativity, of great creativity, demands the utilization of huge amounts of violence and destructiveness. When we share in this work of art as audience or readers, this creativity can become a place where we can not only lodge our own violence, reflect creatively on it rather than act it. Unlike with a video game, we're not only identified with the murderers. We are not the same. We don't have to murder to survive, nor yet are we utterly different. We don't have to kill legally. We do not have to go to war with the other who is also us, for we are all both the same and different. Literature gives us time to think while we stand on our heads. The more our violence is housed as it can be in literature, the more creative thinking oases of peace there will be in the deserts of war, the more islands in the submarine sea that, sea that I crossed with Belinda in 1944. This does not, of course, in itself stop us creating war. It just gives us a chance to reflect creatively and differently on how we might change things. As I finished this, coming to the end of this talk, I sort of found, gosh, I couldn't have ended in the same place last weekend as I want to end today. And that's with remembering Alan Henning, who was here in Salford and was beheaded last Friday. How close murder and legal killing, we do the legal killing, they do the murdering, how close they are in all of us. Thank you. <laughs>